Um, I'm excited about what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, we have been doing kind of a, a short course, quick overview look at Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, I was not successful in doing just a one class, a one 30 minute look at uh, missionary journey number two or missionary journey number three. So we spent the last five weeks looking at his three journeys. Um, but I've had in mind all along to come back to parts of each of the journeys, just one part of each of the journeys, uh, left, I intentionally left out a part of each of those journeys so that we could come back if we needed to with the time, uh, depending on uh, our circumstances. But if we needed to, to come back, to come back and to look at one particular part. And what I want to do tonight is I want us to focus in back on his, his first missionary journey. But I'm excited tonight to look at, to look at one of Paul's sermons. And uh, we're going to look at the sermon that Paul preached uh, to rather, it's, it's a, maybe you might consider a long sermon. Uh, it's, uh, it starts in chapter 13 and about verse 16, which we'll see in a minute. But it's a sermon that Paul preached in Antioch of Pisidia. And uh, what I want to do tonight is just what the screen says. is I, I just want us to spend time studying this, this sermon. But one of my favorite things to do, and, and this, is a weird, this is a weird preacher thing to do, one of my favorite things to do is just to dissect sermons. Whether it's a sermon in the Bible uh, or a, a sermon today, or whether it's in a sermon book or one that's preached, I just like I like just dissect. And I'm not talking about being being critical. And that's not the dissecting. And that's not trying to pick it apart and find problems. I'm not talking about that. I just like finding how is a sermon put together. I like to see how a sermon flows uh, as as the preacher goes through it. And uh, that's just a weird preacher thing. Maybe that's just a weird David thing. I don't know. Um, but, uh, that's just, I, I like, I like, that's just the craft of preaching and the craft of sermon, um, preparation is, uh, just seeing how, how are these things put together? So that's what I want to do tonight, but I want us to go into one of Paul's sermons and I just want us to spend time kind of dissecting it, looking at it, uh, seeing what we can learn from it. And so I hope you got the handout, uh, that was on Facebook and in family news today. Uh, it looks a little bit, well, it looks exactly like this. There are a lot of blanks for you to fill in. Uh, and so I hope you got this. I hope you printed it out. This is for you uh, in tonight's lesson to go through this sermon with me. And, uh, and let's just, let's see what Paul was preaching then and what Paul's preaching to us today. It's the same message. And, uh, and, and I want us to do a little bit of like we're taking notes on Paul's sermon. That's sort of what this is, is kind of we're taking notes and we're trying to find out how, how did Paul, out, how, what was Paul's outline? Well, I think Paul had an outline. Uh, I don't know if he had it on his iPad. I don't know if he was using PowerPoint or what it was, but I think Paul had an outline. And, uh, and so I, I've, I've, I've looked at this and what I, the way I think it outlines. And, uh, but where is Antioch of Pisidia? Uh, that's, that's important for us to, to know uh, just geographically. Uh, I hope that from our first missionary journey, you remember where Antioch of Pisidia is. Here is the map, uh, and it's, this is on the journey, and I'm showing you the map that has the lines on it so you can see his journey. And Antioch of Pisidia is right up here um, where that uh, red arrow is pointed. You can see the word Pisidia down there. Uh, a little bit, uh, and that's that's the region in which this Antioch is found. So it's not Antioch of Syria where he started uh, this particular missionary journey, but it's Antioch of Pisidia uh, where he reached and uh, spent some time there, and he's preaching in the synagogue here. And so here's what I want to do tonight. I want us to act like we're taking notes on Paul's sermon here. I want us to act like uh, we, we are there, and, and I want to share with you some things just about my personal note-taking uh, during sermons, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's here, whether I'm somewhere else, whether it's maybe a lectureship that I'm attending, uh, just some of my personal note-taking uh, things that I do when, when I'm sitting there listening to somebody preach, it's helpful for me to take notes. It helps me to pay attention uh, to what's being said. Uh, and it, it helps me to later on go back and look at what somebody did. And, and again, as somebody's preaching, you know, today I try to figure out what's their outline. And, and if they're not using PowerPoint, then uh, you really got to pay attention to see hey, what's their outline. How, how is this flowing? Um, but here, here's what I generally do at the top of my paper uh, when I'm taking notes when somebody's writing, when somebody's preaching, is up in the top left of the page, I usually write what the title of the lesson is and what the, the scripture reference, the main scripture reference is that they're using. And then up in the top right of the page, uh, I'm going to write the date, 
I'm going to write um, where I am. Uh, if it's FHU, you know, Fried Hardeman Lectureship, uh, if it's uh, in some other place, if it's Palm Beach Lakes, and I'm going to write who's doing the preaching, who's doing the speaking. So I'll write those up generally in the right-hand side of it. But uh, for, this, for this purpose, I'm not dividing this left and right uh, for these notes, but just here, here's, here's what I want you to see, and I hope, I hope you've got this on your handout. Obviously, uh, the speaker that we have uh, for this sermon is, well, let me, let me go forward this time. Uh, the speaker that we have for this is the Apostle Paul. I would be writing this in the top right if I'm taking notes when Paul's preaching. This would be on the top right of my page, that he's the speaker. And then I usually write down the date. Well, as best as we can figure, the date was somewhere around 47 to 48 uh, A.D. I usually write down where I am, uh, just as a point of reference. Well, Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia. Uh, that's the city uh, where he is. And we know from verses 14 and 15... Uh, that Paul is in the synagogue. That was his custom. We know that he was in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. And then sometimes I will write down who is the audience. And I don't always do this, but who's the audience that's being addressed? Um, sometimes I'll do this. If I go to Polishing the Pulpit, um, if, if there's a good speaker uh, who's over speaking to maybe the teenage boys or something, I might go sit in the back of that room and listen to uh, what Dan Winkler might be saying to those teenage boys. So I might write in the top of my page, uh, this was not for me, this was for the teenage boys, that's the audience. Uh, well, the, the audience here in the synagogue is the Jews and the Gentiles. We see this, look in verse 16, look real quick in verse 16, where he starts this sermon and he addresses it to men of Israel and you who fear God. Two different groups here. One, men of Israel being addressed to the Jews and those who fear God is, was a way that he was describing them as Gentiles. We know that was the same expression that was used of Cornelius back in chapter 10. You see this again in verse 26. Look at verse 26 where he says, uh, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham and those of you who fear God. So we see him addressing this to Jews and to Gentiles. Now, Paul did not write, <clears throat> at least I don't believe, that he wrote his title. Maybe he did. Maybe he had a chalkboard or a, uh, a whiteboard, or maybe he had a, a stone tablet. I don't know if he wrote his, his title down so that everybody could take notes on it. But if Paul was writing a title for this sermon, he, he, or even if he didn't, here, here's what I would entitle this sermon to be. I would entitle this sermon, Jesus is the Promised Messiah. Now, you don't read that title in Acts chapter 13. I understand that. Uh, but just as I'm trying to dissect this sermon and figure out, okay, what's the central theme? That's what this, what's, that's the purpose of this title here is what's the central theme of this sermon? The central theme of this sermon is Jesus is the promised Messiah. So that's what I would write in large letters on the top left of my page if I'm there writing, uh, taking notes of Paul's sermon. And then right underneath it, uh, I would write down, uh, what's the text that's being used? Well, the text that's being used for us is Acts chapter 13 verses, or Acts chapter 13 verses 16 through 41. We know that to be that where this sermon is located. Now, obviously, Paul was not quoting from Acts 13 when he preached this, but for our purposes, we're going to use that as the passage. And and you understand that most of the time today, uh, sermons that are preached in churches, they've got a central text that is generally used, and so that's what I'll write on on the top of my page. So. Uh, Jesus is the promised Messiah from Acts chapter 13. Now, what's interesting as you, uh, as you start looking at this is the word promise is found twice in this sermon. If you look in verse 23, you're going to see the word promise uh, that uh, from, his, from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up Israel. And then you see the word promise again in verse 32, uh, where he talks about the fact uh, we declare to you good the glad tidings, that promise which was made to the Father. So the word promise is found twice here in this, in this uh, sermon. And actually the word fulfilled, which is what happens with one of the promises of God, it is fulfilled. The word fulfilled is found three times uh, in this sermon. So we see that this is a, a, a message about God's promise and how God's promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And like good sermons, and not good sermons, like a lot of sermons, I'll just say it that way. Like a lot of sermons today, Paul had three major points. Uh, I didn't purposefully look for three major points, but as I was dissecting this sermon, I saw three major points. Now, again, he's not using bullet points, and, and, and he's not using Roman numeral number one and two and three and all of that. But sometimes as you listen to a sermon, the preacher will say, okay, point number two, point number three, 
Or sometimes as you listen to a sermon, you can listen for certain transition terms. And in, in Paul's sermon, I see three transition terms that give us three major points, the three major things that he's, he's drawing out in his sermon. Notice in verse 16, notice how he begins. He begins in verse 16 by saying, men of Israel and you who fear God. He's addressing his audience. But drop down to verse 26. In verse 26, he says, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God. He has developed, he has dealt with something through verse, from verse 16 down through verse 25. Then he gets to verse 26 and he addresses them again, men and brethren. It's as if he's going to take what he's just said and he's going to develop it a little bit differently and a little bit further. So I see a second major point starting in verse 26. So his first major point is verse 16 through 25. We'll see that in a minute. Second major point was from verse 26 down through verse 37. What's the first word you have in verse 38? I hope you've got your Bibles open, okay? This, this lesson tonight is absolutely useless. If, you don't have your, if you're just sitting here watching me, this is not going to be very good. If you've got your Bibles open, we're going to dig into this sermon and, and, and text, and I hope you'll do that with me. So drop down to verse 38. What's the first word you got in verse 38? My Bible's got the word, therefore. That's a key word. That's a transition term. That's a, that's, a, that's a term of conclusion and a term, in this case, of application. And so from verse 30, 38 down through verse 41 is the third major point of this sermon. So we got three major points uh, in this sermon. And so I, I just want us to dig in here, and I want us to find how we can take this lesson. And it would be interesting. Some of you are uh, some of you are preachers, some of you are teachers in other places. Uh, this would be an interesting sermon for you to preach. Um, not my outline, Paul's outline. To just take this, this is a, this is a sermon that we'll still preach today. It's, it's not that, oh, it, it only fit that audience 2,000 years ago. This is a sermon that you could take and preach today in the Lord's church and, and, uh, and find, very, find it to be very effective. Uh, in its message even today. So let's start Let's start in, uh, in Roman numeral number one. And I want to start in verse 26. And I want you to see the first thing that Paul develops here is that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah because of the promise that was made. Because of the promise that was made. And starting in verse 16, what he does is he talks about how this promise was developed and prepared through Israel. We, we don't have time to... Uh, to develop this in, in depth tonight, and, and I wish we did, um, but we don't have time. But I, I want you to get your Bible. Please get your Bible. Please don't just look at the screen and, and, and wonder what these. Please get your Bible and look at this, because to me, this, this, this is fun. To me, this is fun to dig in and say, okay, here's what Paul does. He's about ready to talk to them about Jesus, the promised Messiah. And what he does is to first say the promise had, for him to be the promised Messiah, the promise had to be made. So what God does first in, in this sermon, he, God does things before he does things with Israel. But in this sermon, Paul starts with Israel. And so in verse 16, he, he addresses the Jews and the Gentiles. And in starting in verse 17, he said, the God of this people, Israel, the God of Israel, the God of the Jews, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers, where? In the land of Egypt. And so Paul is going back and talking about the time when God chose Israel, where were they? God chose Israel while they, according where Paul is starting, chose them while they were in Egypt. And he chooses them in Egypt. And verse 17 says he, that he exalted them. He chose them while they were strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of Egypt. And so you remember the story. We don't have time to go back to the book of Exodus, but you remember when God's people were down in the land of Egypt and they were there as slaves in, in Egypt. They were in bondage and God brought them out. He selected them to be his chosen people. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6 talks about them being his chosen people uh, that he had selected. Verse 18 says, now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. What a way to say that. Because you know when God got them out of Egypt, they came to Sinai. And at Sinai, Deuteronomy 5 and verse 2 says, He made a covenant with the Jews at Mount Sinai. A covenant is a promise. And so He made a covenant. He made a promise with the Jews at Mount Sinai that they were going to be His special people. 
Now, you remember when they first went to the promised land in Numbers 13 and 14 that they refused to take it. And so God sent them into the wilderness to wander for 40 years. And this verse says that Paul summarizes those 40 years by saying, God put up with them. Wow. Does God still put up with me? I mean, we, we look at them and say, you know, sorry, Israelites, you shouldn't have done that. You had, well, what about me? God puts up with me. He put up with them for 40 years. He still puts up with me. Now, verse 19 says, when he had destroyed seven nations, they're not listed here. They're listed back in the Old Testament, and some of you can name them. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. So that's the book of Joshua. That's a summary of the book of Joshua, that, that they go in and conquer the land, one verse summary, and that God disperses, he divides that land out to them. He is their chosen people. Now, you remember God making a promise to Abraham? Now, who's Abraham? Abraham is the grandfather of Israel. God made a promise to Abraham, made the same promise to Jacob, made the same, pro- same promise to Isaac, made the same promise to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, from which we have the Israelites. And so when God is making a covenant with Israel, he is making a covenant with the descendants of Israel, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. God promised Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. What do we read about in these verses right here? Israel being brought out of Egypt. God said, I'm going to give of you a great land. Summarized right here in verse 19, God gave them that great land of Canaan and distributed it to them. We see, that. what are we talking about? A promise here. We see God making good on his promise. And then he gave them judges in verse 20. And then he gave them a king in verse 21. And that king was named Saul. That first king was named Saul. So the first thing that Paul is doing is talking to them about the things that the Jews would readily understand. The days of the Israelites. The days when God was working among his people and he was making a promise to the Israelites. Now Paul is carrying them along because he's going to point out that Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. But we're not there yet. He's just carrying them along in a way that they would, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, yes, God was working through Israel. Now, you get down you get down to verse 22. And he moves from from talking about just Israel and that history into the King Saul. And now he talks about the promise and the preparation that God was making through David in verse 22. When When he had removed Saul as king, he raised up for them David as king, a man after God's own heart who would do all of God's will, he says in verse 22. And then he says, from this man's seed... From the descendants, this is, this is a key verse in verse 23. From the descendants of David, according to the promise. Wait a minute. What promise? Well, you could go back to the promise God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this is even great, even in addition to that promise. And according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior. His name is Jesus. God not only promised Abraham that through his seed all of the nations of the earth would be blessed, but God promised to David that God that he would raise up of his seed and he would establish his kingdom forever. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, even David remembered uh, that God had sworn to him. In, in Psalm 132 and verse 11, God swore to David, I will set upon your throne the fruit of of your body. That's the seed. So Psalm 132 and verse 11 is the promise perhaps that's being addressed here, and that is that God swore to David that he would set up Christ, that he would set up a descendant of David to sit upon his throne. How does the New Testament begin? The New Testament begins a genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And that's what's being addressed here. And so again, Paul is just talking about things they would know and understand and carrying them along saying, you know about God and what he did with Israel. You know what about God and what he did and what he did through David. And, and he just drops Jesus here in, in verse 23 and he's going to address it for a moment. But he's, that, that's the main point of this sermon. Remember, Jesus is the promised Messiah. That's the main point of this sermon. But he puts that here to say God was working through Israel through the promise he made through Israel to bring about Christ. He's going to get to that point. He was working through David to bring about the Christ. That is his point. And then you get to verses 24 and 25, which are, for me are the last two verses of this first section. And he brings in John, again, someone that is more of a modern day to them, but someone they would, that, whose name they would recognize 
in verse 24, he says, After John had first preached, before his Christ's coming, John preached the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. John came preaching to the Jews, telling them they needed to be baptized. They needed to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins, Mark 1 and verse 4. And as John was finishing his course, interesting way for Paul to say that in verse 25, as John was finishing his course, what was his course? He, he was to come and prepare the way of the Lord to make his path straight, Isaiah 40 and verse 3 said. So John comes and prepares the way of the Lord, and he says, I'm not the one, and there's one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to loose. And so that first section is, is God, is Paul using his Old Testament scriptures to talk about God's promise. And, and to, he, he, he's just dropped the name Jesus there to let them know that, that that was the seed of David, which they knew from a genealogical standpoint. But that's not his point. His point is that he is the fulfillment of God's promise. And that's where he's getting in this next section. So the first major section you've got here of, of, of this sermon as we dissect it is Jesus is the Messiah because of the promise that was made. Now you start in verse 26 and here's the heart of the sermon. Here's the transition terms, men and brethren in verse 26. He's getting to the heart of his sermon. And we see in this section that Jesus is the Messiah and we see not just the promise of it, we see the proof of it. We see without a doubt that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. He is the promised Messiah. And Paul nails that down tight in this section where he says to them, look in verse 26. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those of you who fear God, Jews and Gentiles, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. Oh, what a great message that was. Salvation was tied to the message that, that he was preaching to them. They needed to listen. If they wanted to have this salvation from God, they needed to be paying attention. And so he talks about what happened to Jesus. Look in verse 27. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, Christ, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they, they were ignorant of what they had been reading in the synagogue every Sabbath or in the temple every Sabbath. They were ignorant of it. But even in their ignorance, they fulfilled the prophets, what they wrote. How did they fulfill it? In condemning him. The end of verse 27 says, they didn't make the connection between what they were doing and rejecting Jesus and, and what, what they, in, uh, in the scriptures that, that were prophesied back in, in Isaiah chapter 53, for, perhaps, where Isaiah said he is despised and rejected of men in verse 3. <laughs> they were fulfilling Isaiah 53 in verse 3. They didn't realize it, he says, but look at the word fulfilled in verse 27. They did not understand. They were not paying attention to the prophets that were read every Sabbath. They should have known better, Paul says, but guess what they were doing? They were fulfilling the will of God and the promise of God all the while. And so verse 28 says, Though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he be put to death. They were fulfilling the very promise that God had made in the Old Testament. What do you have here? You've got the proof that Jesus is the Messiah, but you've got it even more than this, not just, in his, not just in his rejection, but in his death. Look at the word fulfilled in verse 29 again. Nor when, nor now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, well, how did they do that? They put him to death in verse 29. They, they, were, they were doing this unknowingly, were they fulfilling the promise of God in the Old Testament. And now by putting Jesus to death, they were fulfilling those Old Testament scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 53, it had talked about that he would, uh, that he would be cut off from the land of the living. Um, and verse 9 of Isaiah 53 says that his grave would be made with the wicked and the rich at his death. You remember Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. They were fulfilling those prophecies. Uh, and, but what is it? It's proof that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. But even stronger proof, e e even, even, more, even more solid and, and just uh, 
unquestionable, unarguable truth about Jesus being the Messiah and unarguable proof that he is the promised Messiah, not just his rejection, not just proven by his death, but was proven by his resurrection. And right there, verses 30 through 37 on your screen, is the, is the heart of this sermon. It's the heart of the gospel, but it is the heart of this sermon. It was the heart of all New Testament preaching. If you go back and study the P Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, what was the heart of his sermon? The resurrection of Jesus. That was the heart of it. And so that's the heart of this sermon. Paul would say that's, that was, that's what he preached everywhere that he went. And so they put him to death. I love the first two words in verse 30. The first two words in verse 30 are fun. Because what did man do? They put Jesus to death. What are the first two words you've got in verse 30? But God. God was in control of this. They fulfilled those promises that were made back in the Old Testament. They fulfilled them unknowingly. God fulfilled the promises of the resurrection. He did it knowingly and purposeful when he raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus was raised by the power of God. Jesus, and we don't have time to look at all of these verses. He was raised by the power of God, verse 30. He was witnessed by many people in verse 31. And so there were multitudes of witnesses who saw him. That is proof of his resurrection, which is proof of him being the Messiah. And so in verse 32, Paul says, We declare to you good news, glad tidings. We declare to you the good news of the promise. There's that word again, which was made to the fathers. Verse 33 is the third time we see the word fulfilled, that God has fulfilled this for us, their children. God fulfilled what he promised to do in raising Jesus from the dead. And you see three different verses here that Paul quotes from the Old Testament that were talking about Jesus being raised from the dead. Those were the promises. And what do you have when God raises Jesus from the dead? You have the fulfillment of those promises. What do you have? You've got the proof that he is the Messiah. And when he was raised, he was raised permanently, no more to return to corruption. Everybody else in the Bible who was raised from the dead, Old Testament and New Testament, everybody else who was raised from the dead, they died again. But Jesus would never see corruption again. He was raised by the power of God, and he was raised from the power of God permanently. And this, as I said, is the heart of the gospel. This is the zenith of the gospel. You have all of those prophets in the Old Testament, all of those promises in the Old Testament. And when you get to the, this is, this is, this isn't exciting. This, you, you could almost hear Paul just, his voice just beginning to, to drive these points home. And you can almost hear him start to, to preach just a little more stronger as he's talking about God raised him and he was seen. And this is good news of the promises of God being fulfilled. And God wants to save all mankind. You can almost hear Paul just, just, just nailing each of those points because because that's the whole focus of this sermon. You've got the promise. You've got the proof. Very quickly, because we're out of time. You've got the promise. You've got the proof. In the last verses, Jesus is the Messiah. Paul, what's the point? You've proven it to us. What's the point? Transition term is verse 38, the word therefore. What's the point, Paul? Well, here's the point. The point is that through Christ alone, you can have forgiveness of sins in verse 38. You could have your sins covered over under that old covenant, but you can have your sins wiped away, gone, forgiven, never to be remembered again because of Jesus Christ. That's the point. Similar to that in verse 39 is that through Christ alone is the justification from all. Look at the word all in verse 39. Justification, be justified from all things. You couldn't have that, he says, under the law of Moses. You couldn't have it. But under Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the promised Messiah, you can have justification from all of those sins under which, under the old covenant, blood, blood of bulls and goats. No, no, no. Couldn't take away sin, but the blood of Jesus Christ can. But notice in verse 39 that he's talking about everyone who believes. Everybody who obeys God can be saved. This covenant, this promise is for all men of all nations. That's the point. That's the beauty of what he's saying here. But as you close in, verse, in, in these final verses of 40 and 41, he says, but guys, you better watch out. He gives them a warning. He says, if you reject Jesus as the Messiah, you are no better than those stubborn Jews who rejected God and went into Babylonian captivity. He quotes from the book of Habakkuk. 
And Habakkuk was warning, he's telling God's people, you're going into captivity. Why? Because you despise the promises of God. And so you're going into Babylonian captivity. And so what does he say? What is Paul takes that verse and he says to these individuals, who is he preaching to? Jews and Gentiles in the synagogue in, in Antioch of Pisidia. And he says, folks, if what happened to the Jews when they rejected God, they were thrown into Babylonian captivity, so much worse more for you. If you reject Jesus as the promised Messiah, there are severe consequences that await you. Don't let that happen happen. This, to me, is an exciting sermon. It's a sermon that needs to be preached today. It is a sermon that could be preached today to show that Jesus is the Messiah. To go back to the Old Testament and see the promise that was made. To come to his life and to see the proof in his rejection and his death and in his, especially his resurrection. But every good sermon it's got to have that personal application that says, okay, you've proven that he's the promised Messiah. What's the point? The point is you can be forgiven if you obey God. To me, this is a fun thing to do. You might think it's weird to get in and dissect a sermon and to see how it's put together, but this is a fun sermon, and it's why I left when we were in the first missionary journey, why I didn't spend time talking about it back then, because it's taken me 34 minutes just to get through the sermon alone uh, tonight. But go back and read through it. Imagine being there and you hear Paul preach this. Be convicted again with the proof that Jesus is the promised Messiah. It's really an exciting study.